on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. The desert is a place that people have gone to as a means of throwing away the artifice, throwing away what's at the surface and delving deep into one's own spirit and identity and how that begins to connect with the world around you. I learned the language of science to describe these things and in the process, slowly, slowly, it starts to contract part of your ability to receive a little bit. It is the sun, it is the harshness of the desert conspiring in this tremendous way to bring you this most delectable and sweet treat under the most adverse conditions. You could say that we have like a tremendous deficiency or starving to death from a lack of our plant relationships. He was smoking tobacco from his corncob pipe and he started praying around me in his, his language and blowing the smoke. And then after a while, things were quiet and he said, things are going to be okay. Episode number 41 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Walking the Plant Medicine Path with John Slattery is brought to you by Sir Thrival. When I founded Sir Thrival 12 years ago, my vision was to offer nutritional and medicinal supplements from the plant, animal, and fungal kingdoms to support humans living in the damaging and toxic conditions of our modern industrialized world. One of the first supplements I formulated was our pine pollen extract because I'd been learning about the rapid decline in testosterone that accompanies aging in men, but also the way our modern living conditions are overwhelming our bodies with synthetic estrogens. When I learned that pine pollen contains testosterone and other androgenic hormones, I wanted to create a supplement that could be used as an alternative to synthetic hormone replacement therapy. If you or someone you know is looking for a natural testosterone supplement, check out Sir Thrival's pine pollen lineup. Right now, until August 27th, all Pine Pollen products at Surth Rival are 20% off with the coupon code PINE20. That's the word PINE with the numbers 20, PINE20. If you want to learn more about the modern science on Pine Pollen or how to harvest your own, we carry a book there by the herbalist Stephen Herod Buner called Pine Pollen, Ancient Medicine for a Modern World. Surth Rival's Pine Pollen, it's testosterone supplementation direct from the natural world. Find it at surthrival.com. And hey, if you haven't watched the Wild Fed TV show yet, you are really missing out. Hearing about the modern day hunting and gathering lifestyle on this podcast is one thing, but seeing it, meeting the species and the characters involved is a whole other level. Go over to wild-fed.com and check out the series. And if you want to get more in-depth insights into the backstory of the episodes, as well as the gear and tactics we're using, check out the director's cuts too. Those are each between one to two hours of additional content to deep in your understanding of the modern hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Also, on this podcast, most of the episodes are me interviewing other folks. If you're interested in hearing me being interviewed, I was recently on my friend Luke Story's show, The Lifestylist Podcast. The episode is number 292, and it's called Fake Food and Modern Medicine, Reclaim Your Health with Nature's Wisdom. So go ahead and check that out if you want to hear a bit more from me personally. I'm Daniel Vitalis. And you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Now on to today's show. This conversation is a bit of a departure from most of the content we've explored on the show in the previous 40 episodes, but it's a bit more in keeping with my former show, Rewild Yourself. My guest is John Slattery, who's a bioregional herbalist living and working in Arizona. John's the author of two beautiful books, one on foraging in the desert southwest and the other on medicinal plants of that same region. But John's approach is not solely a reductive and scientific one. As you'll hear in the show, he can certainly speak that language, but his relationship with plants much more resembles that of our ancestral one. While much of herbalism today has been reduced to the study of isolated phytochemical constituents, often in an effort to establish credibility under allopathic medicine's monopoly on healthcare, many of us have a significantly broader and more metaphysical conceptualization of how and why these plants work for and with us medicinally. Think of it like this. If I asked you why you like hanging out with your best friend, you might describe some of the qualities of that person aspects of their personality and interests that make them feel good to be around. 
you probably wouldn't reduce the relationship to the chemicals you excrete into your blood supply when you're around them. You look at them holistically. In other words, you wouldn't say, I really like hanging out with John because of the oxytocin I secrete when I'm around him and the endorphins I feel when we talk. He really suppresses my cortisol levels. That'd be a bit myopic. We see the experience of hanging out with John as a conglomeration of many different things woven together into a totality. We aren't super reductive with other humans. Now, of course, plants aren't human, but they are alive. They are each living individuals, and we can gain benefits from spending time with them, whether that means eating them, making salves, tinctures, and teas from them, smoking them, and sometimes just being in their presence. That plants are more than the sum of their parts, more than just chemicals, was always understood in herbalism. That is, until reductionism became the mode of the day. Well, in this conversation, John gently eases us out of that rigid mental frame and invites us back into a world of wonder and possibility. And that's what I love about plants and plant people. Foragers and herbalists, despite what they might tell you, almost always still believe there's magic left in the world. And personally, I do too. Like John, that doesn't mean I don't believe in science. Quite the contrary. But rather that I think that science is just one of the operating systems we can run in our brain. It's just one lens through which we view the world. But it's not the only one. And in fact, it's rather new. It's brought tremendous advances and advantages, but it's certainly brought as much destruction and disenchantment too. And in some ways, you could even say that it's killing the human spirit, even while it's racing to vivify the machines. So, while studies have shown that people living in primitive societies are significantly happier and mentally healthier than those living in the opulent conditions that science has created, still we barrel ahead, eradicating any and all vestiges of wonder that remain from our 300,000-year Homo sapiens evolution. But still, the natural world draws us back, some of us to the point of a kind of childlike enchantment, and it's often the plants that remind us of something innately human, that the world is indeed full of wonder. We didn't create it, and despite all our sciences, we still barely understand it. Remember, we don't really know what life is, or where it comes from, or where it goes. We can't create it on our own in a lab. At present, only life begets life, and we aren't even close to understanding its origins. With all we've come to understand, we still know very little of the world. And that is, in my opinion, a good thing. And sometimes, it's okay to just be humbled by the mystery of it all. John Slattery, welcome to the show. Hey, Daniel. Thanks for having me. Man, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. I mean, you and I have been talking uh, online a little bit and uh, finally kind of getting a chance to sit down with you. I'm sitting here, by the way, with your two books, Southwest Medicinal Plants and Southwest Foraging. I am a huge fan. I just a I really love that part of the country where you are. And I'm just, I love going out. I spent a lot of time in Arizona. Um, but I haven't really connected in with anybody who does what you do out there, not at the level that you do. So um, could you tell us a little bit about sort of where you live, what you do, and how you got, um, you know, started doing all this stuff? Sure. Happy to share on that. So I have been residing in Tucson for most of the past uh, 15 to 18 years with a few stints uh, outside of town, but mostly within this bioregion. So when I speak about my bioregion, it's the greater Sonoran Desert, and then a little bit expanded beyond that. We are technically near the northeastern uh, corner of the Sonoran Desert, which is predominantly down into Mexico. So most people in the U.S. think of Sonoran Desert pretty much just in Arizona, but there's quite a bit more in Sonora. And I have spent a lot of time over the past decade plus uh, visiting with, meeting uh, by chance circumstances and, 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 uh, and fortunate introductions with indigenous um, plant enthusiasts, you know, herbalists, healers, foragers themselves in the Sonoran Desert from different tribes. And so that's comprised a lot of my, my background as well. It's contributed greatly to my background. Um, but I originally, I came here, um, you know, initially as a visitor, uh, I was born and raised outside of Chicago. So this at one point was a very unique habitat, uh, to me, but for the time that I came here and how I was oriented at that time, it really became 
my homeland, my home landscape. And so um, in all regards, I know this landscape better than any other place that I know because um, when I arrived here, it was really about immersing myself in the plants. And I had no idea at the time that I arrived here that um, this this locale, in fact, Pima County in which Tucson's uh, located, is the second most diverse county for flora in North America, second to San Diego. Whoa, wow. Yeah. Can you say that one more time? You're saying that Pima County is the second most diverse for plants in the country? Yeah, has the second really? highest total of, of flora count outside of San Diego County. So San Diego, of course, has the, has the coastal influence, so that's what makes it different. But um, the mountains here, well, they're generally referred to as the Sky Islands, um, as a phenomenon in which over millennia, the landscape has changed in the valleys or basins in between mountains such that the flora and fauna have theoretically retreated up into the mountains and then developed distinct characteristics in each one. But that aside, as you go up into the Sky Islands uh, from Tucson, well, the most immediate one are the Catalinas, uh, the largest peak above Tucson, Mount Lemmon, at about 9,400 feet. These mountains specifically, of all the Sky Islands, have been shown to be the most diverse in flora because you have saguaro, palo verde at the bottom, and maple, aspen, spruce, and so forth up at the top. So it's, it's quite an adventure exploring throughout the year. Yeah, I mean, you can go from desert, you start just driving up altitude and you're into coniferous forest pretty fast. It's like an amazing diversity. You know, being somebody who lives in the Northeast where you can drive like a hundred miles and things don't really change that dramatically. You know, it just kind of looks the same from here to Pennsylvania almost. And uh, there it's just so dramatic. So um, I've spent some time up on Mount Graham and, uh, you know, I'd go down into the desert um, to be at the hot springs and you know, I just, I couldn't believe that, that change. So Sky Island feels like a really appropriate way to describe it. Um, when did you become, so you came from Chicago, <laughs> which is like a dramatically different landscape too. How did you get interested in plants and, and when did that start for you and what kind of sparked it? Yeah, so it was a bit roundabout. I didn't jump straight from Chicago to here, but I lived for several years, about five years in uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn. And that's where the change started to take place for me as I was uh, dreaming about what was out in the West. I had, you know, through mm -hmm. fiction and nonfiction that I was reading, uh, I started to really dream about being out West where I hadn't traveled yet. And then uh, around that same period of time, uh, I had a friend, a co-worker and friend who was um, at some kind of natural healing school. And so I had, I had some really bad knee pain at the time, I think largely as a consequence of uh, drinking too much alcohol, and probably, um, from what I've learned since, uh, has still having abundant gluten in my diet. So anyway, mid, mid-20s, mid living in a third-floor apartment, and really severe pain in my knees getting up three flights of stairs every day. So he said, I've got a remedy for you. Why don't you try this yucca root? I'm like, uh, yucca root? The only yucca I knew about at the time was in the the Caribbean restaurants, you know, the, the, the root vegetable yucca. So no, this right. is different. This is from the desert. And so I went to GNC and got capsules, you know, a little bottle of capsules of yucca and started taking that. And sure enough, my knee pain improved dramatically. So that was oh, wow. kind of like a, just a, a really, you know, for me now, run of the mill, uh, almost superficial type of introduction to, to herbalism is like began to open my mind to, what's possible really still in the back of my mind but fast forward a few years uh i was out west and right after 9 11 i did a a four-day um solo retreat in the high elevation desert of northwestern new mexico uh near chaco canyon and so that it just coincided that 9-11 happened at that time, but I was planning to do this for several months. And so I, I camped there at the campground for a time and left my vehicle there and then wandered off in the distance uh, where nobody where nobody goes and spent three days in a circle uh, on the sandstone mesa fasting and, uh, and looking for guidance and direction in my life. And not too long after that, 
I found myself traveling southward, uh, had given away most of my possessions, signed my vehicle over to a friend, <laughs> uh, put on a backpack and headed south over the border from, from Tucson into Nogales. And uh, I, was, I was on my way to Brazil. I was going to make it by land all the way. <laughs> yeah, so, man. The first night I was, I, I broke down. I think I, it finally dawned on me what I was undertaking and what I was leaving behind. And uh, I, I became scared. I became doubtful. But I worked through that and got up the next day and continued on my journey. But what that journey resulted in as an overview of, of a year descending into the Americas and not ever anticipating that I would come back was I met people all along the way that were reflect, reflecting back to me that I was meant to work with plants as medicine. It, it went from the, the subtle opinion to the deep and profound uh, deep and profound uh, experience in which people transcended lifetimes with me and reflected back to me different, you know, galactic landscapes in which we existed and where they knew me as a, as a plant healer. And uh, <laughs> that, that, that blew my mind, you know, to the point where I was ready to turn tail and run when I heard people saying that. Yet deep down there was something within me that I couldn't deny that was – that was true about that, but I was still yet afraid to accept it and, and still programmed to doubt myself under any, how, how old were you then? I was about 27. Yeah. Wow. No so it was a profound transitional period, you know, that mm -hmm. whole Saturn return. Saturn return. Yeah. There was a lot going on and I really threw myself into it. You know, I went, I, I was in the Copper Canyon of the, of Chihuahua, the, Sierra Tarumara, and um, it just would go off into the mountains and, uh, and hike for days in directions that, you know, people told me where to go. I'd meet someone from a small enclave or a village and run into indigenous people, and I was really exploring, you know, and, and not worried about how I was going to get back. I wasn't tethered to anything. And so in mm. this process, I really allowed myself to let go of a lot of those doubts and, and come face to face with the fears. But in the end, what I was left looking at was, you know, this path was open to me to work with plants and every direction that I turned, tried to turn away from it. It just brought me right back to it where when I eventually landed in Brazil after over a half year of traveling, um, I came upon, um, so a bit, a bit of a context of the story. I had hiked into the, um, Chapada Giamanchina on a Sunday when Brazil was playing in the World Cup <laughs> and the entire village <laughs> in war cheering as I hiked up into the clouds of the Chapada Giamanchina because I heard on the other side of this mountain range there was a village where they practiced permaculture. And so I just showed up one, one day out of the clouds into this village and everybody's just hanging around. They said, you know, in Brazilian or uh, Portuguese, they said, you know, Oh, you want a coffee? <laughs> just <laughs> out of the clouds in a backpack, you know, it's just like, yeah. normal. and then somebody's <laughs> like, are you here for the permaculture class? I'm like, yeah, I guess so. So in a couple of days, this agroforestry perm slash permaculture class was starting. And um, so I, I went through that, made some friends and, and then jump ahead. I find myself in Brasilia, capital city of Brazil. Um, staying with a couple of people, one Brazilian, one American, who were part of that class. And this American was really endeavored to, to engage in some um, large-scale permaculture projects with indigenous people there. And I thought it was interesting, but I was, I was doing my own thing. In fact, I was looking online at like herbal studies programs because these wheels were starting to turn within me as like how I could take this deeper. And my host, the Brazilian woman, she comes back to her apartment after she had taken the American to this meeting with these indigenous um, men. And she said, Mujual. She's, that's what they called me instead of John. Mujual. She said, they're, she's speaking in Portuguese, they're asking for you. And I said, what do you mean they're asking for me? She said, he, he, he asked, where's the other one? And nobody knew who I was or how many were in this group. But somehow this man, whose name is Tue, which means fire in the Tapunio Fulnio uh, Tapuya language, he asked about me. He wanted to know where I was. 
So she brought me back and I showed up and they were sitting around a fire. They have a little favela that they had built in the, in, in the park. You know, it was just, they're basically squatting in the park because it, this wasn't the region that they were from, but they were there in the capital because a lot of indigenous people come there to, to work. And so we had this really intense first meeting, like we knew each other from a long time ago and he was smoking uh, tobacco from his corn cob pipe and he started praying around me in his, his language and blowing the smoke. And, uh, and then after a while, things were quiet and he said, things are going to be okay. And so from that moment, we had a brotherhood and uh, I lived there for a while with his family. And it turned out that both he and his brother were herbless. And they had uh, they had a, they had built a little herb shop there in the the Brazilian form of the BIA there, and um, so I would go down to the we'd go into town every day and hang out in the herb shop. I'd help him organize. He'd teach me the names of the plants and what they're used for. And so that was like my first official apprenticeship that I just stumbled into or was effectively called into, despite my my awareness of it. And, uh, was the herbalism you were part of there, were you drinking ayahuasca or were you uh, just, you know, working with medicinal plants of a tamer nature or, or what was the kind of, sounds right. like you were involved with some shamanism there? Well, I, I had experiences with, I did, um, I was introduced to ayahuasca there, yes, and, and other, and other um, entheogenic plants, let's call them. And in fact, Jagubi was part of their um, you know, medicinal, you know, their materia medica. That's one of that's, uh, what, what is that? What is that plant? I'm not familiar. Jagubi is um, is part of the the blend. So it uh, okay, the, it's an admixture in their ayahuasca. Yep, yeah, the one that brings the visions, and so okay, uh, okay. In Peru, they call it chacruna. Right, and I think chacruna is a different form that can be combined with the banisteriopsis vine, if I remember okay. correctly. Um, okay. This was from the, they're from the, um, uh, the region in the Northeast Pernambuco. So they were bringing out to Brasilia a place, an area where the Benisteriopsis vine does grow, uh, different okay. plants from, from the desert area. And so they, they were aware of that, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't part of what they were bringing, um, you know, to this, to this area, to this region. But certainly I did have those experiences and from those experiences, I was propelled even more on this pathway of, of working with the plants from the visions that I received and the teachings mm -hmm. that I received from those plants. Yeah, it's a very, um, very powerful time. I want to ask you in a moment to bring us up to the present sort of and let us know what you do now um, for context. But I guess I, I have this question I want to ask you first. And maybe the question's like a little obvious and a little silly, but um, and I want to preface it by saying... Uh, Here's the question, and then let me add one piece before you answer. I, I want to ask the question of why when I why do you think when I go to the desert southwest or I go into South America, Mesoamerica, I feel proximity of spirit in a way that I I live in Maine, you know, south of me is Boston and then New York. And in this part of the country, there's not a lot of openness. Uh, people don't yeah. want to tune inwardly. Um, but I get out to the desert Southwest and it's not just the people cause I could be alone in the desert and I just feel the proximity of spirit so strong. Um, and so I'm curious, I, cause I understand that that's not a literally true thing. I know that, you know, spirit is always present, but like, how do you, why, why do you think that is exactly? Or, or do you even, can you relate to what I'm saying? Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. I, I really appreciate your question, Daniel, because, uh, I feel like I have a lot to say about that. I, I observed that, you know, on that journey that I was just giving an overview of, that was a, a big part of that education, was understanding that different places have different energies. Um, and when I came back here to Tucson, I recognized that the energy was quite different from where I had been. In many regards, uh, places in Brazil, where the energy was much more active, much more engaging, things happened more quickly, you might say. There was a lot more, there was greater dynamic, uh, more dynamic. Um, whereas here in the desert, I feel that things happen more slowly. And that, in fact, um, we are brought, in some regards, we're, we're brought to a place of silence within ourselves. If we're open and receptive to that, that can um, maybe help us feel more at home within ourselves if, if we're capable of that. Whereas 
you know, other certainly other places in the country I've been and lived, there's a there's a kinetic energy on the surface that that certainly induces a lot of movement, a lot of thought, a lot of activity, but can um, you might say distract or detract one from really dropping in deep to connecting with oneself. And I believe because yeah, you could you I, could call it fr- you could call it kinetic, but you could also call it frenetic, right? Like it's yeah, a little right. a little sure. frantic. You know? Most definitely. Um, yeah, so I, I can, I can totally relate to what you're saying. And, um, you know, I have other ideas about this, you know, that, that, that transcend lifetimes even, but, um, just for the, you know, staying within the present moment, I, I feel like, um, the desert is a place that, uh, people have gone to, you know, not just this desert, but deserts all over the world as a means of, you know, throwing away the artifice, throwing away what's at the surface and delving deep into one's own spirit and identity and how that begins to connect with the world around you. And that's, that's, that's connects deeply with my concepts of bioregional herbalism or, you know, just relationship to landscape. And uh, whether it's, whether it's a moist coniferous forest in the Pacific Northwest or the hottest, driest desert, you can imagine the, the the living tenor of of the landscape and all of its articulations through animals and plants and rocks and insects I see it all as alive and telling a story and also not just incessantly telling its own story but really responsive in that mm. when we show up it can reflect back to us who we are at that time and the accumulation of what we've been you know and and show us the potential for where we could go. And for that, you know, that for me is the the greatest potency right now that wild plants have to offer. I don't believe that we necessarily have to ingest plants to experience the healing from them. In fact, in some regards, you know, from our perspective and our mental outlook, our awareness of self, just simply tuning into that awareness amongst plants and with plants can be more intensely potent for an individual than any particular you know, uh, tincture remedy or tea or plant constituent that you can imagine, and and certainly consciousness altering. That's uh, there's a lot, there's a lot there. I, I get. I want to refer uh, refer first to what you were just saying about plants. I mean, I, I I've had pretty powerful experiences just putting a Deterra flower under my pillow <laughs> at night. You know what I mean? So I really relate to what you're saying in the way that plants can commune and communicate with you without necessarily ingesting them. I feel like we, um, we are always looking for the the big hit in our culture, you know? So there's this like, well, I'll eat it, uh, but I really get what you're saying. And then I guess I was really touched by what you were just saying about how the sort of bio region, regionality and the, the tenor of the landscape can shape the consciousness of the sort of, I guess, uh, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but sort of shapes how you feel and shapes your consciousness a little bit. And, and I guess like what, what's hard for me looking out at the world today, I guess something that kind of saddens me a little bit is the homogeneity that we've created where it's like every town, the built landscape is so homogenous. So you can go anywhere in the country and it's the same stores and it's the same shops and it's the same streets and it's the same street names. And it's just like, you can almost, if you just stay in the built environment, everywhere is almost becoming the same, but then you step out onto the landscape and every place is different. So um, I, I would love to hear a little bit your thoughts on the the peoples of the desert Southwest where you are now. Um, who, like, what's a brief overview for listeners about who those people were and what the character of the peoples that lived there pre-Columbian um, and how they were integrated into the landscape? Because from the outside perspective, it's a very harsh place. Um, obviously water's at a premium there and that's a, that's a, the, a, the limiting factor. Um, and also you have this unique flora, like of course, uh, cactuses are unique to the Americas and aren't found in deserts around the world. So you have these very unique flora, um, what, in your experience, and, and I know you can't really speak on behalf, but, but how did that landscape shape the people in the life ways, um, of the desert Southwest? Yeah, those are great, great questions. I most certainly they have. And I think um, I think you can see it somewhat in the remnants of culture that exist. Uh, perhaps how long people have been here, you know, it might may attest to how long individual tribes have been here, as to how um, 
indistinct some may be from the landscape. And so I'll start with the, um, I have personal relationships with some Seri families or Konkak people, uh, often referred to as the people of the desert and the sea, because they had navigated uh, through the Sea of Cortez amongst the islands there. Uh, primarily uh, Isla Tiburon was their homeland, but they would, uh, they built boats, not unlike boats that were made, say, in Egypt or in, in, in Polynesia, where they took reeds um, that were gathered at springs on the islands, and then they wrapped them together with another plant, uh, basically the, the distal runner, root runners of mesquite, of honey mesquite that grows oh, wow. uh, in the flatlands there. Yeah, so you can, uh, in response to rains, these would grow even more pro- prolifically, so I would imagine they'd be gathering them towards middle, end of rainy season, and you could dig in maybe a, a few inches under the ground and pull one up and extract it, maybe even... 20, 30 feet back to, to the mesquite tree and, and cut it back. So they would pound those and turn them into cordage and then wrap the, the canes. And that's okay. how they were you know, traversing the seas and, and hunting the seas. So my experience of them is that they have, have the most, uh, you know, they have the least distinctness between themselves and the environment because I've met people who grew up on the island eating Everything that they, everything they consumed was from the desert or the sea. Like they didn't know a piece of cilantro, uh, a chicken egg, an onion, or a corn tortilla. Like very quintessential Mexican foods of today that people that are now in their seventies, you know, were born on this island and never never ate a bit of that, and probably didn't even hear a word of Spanish until they were teenagers. Wow! So that's it's hard to conceive of in the world we are today, and that I could be there in their village you know, for lunch if I left early enough in the morning. So it's, it's just so real quick. Cool. The sea of the sea of Cortez is, is that between Baja and mainland Mexico or yeah. where's the sea of Cortez? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Gulf of California, I think is also how it's referred to. Yeah. But yeah, sea sure. of Cortez. And like Isla Tiburon or Shark Island is the largest island associated with Mexico. And that was the, the, the modern day homeland of this area, which they were evicted from back in the sixties, I believe. And now is essentially a hunting grounds for a big one sheep, but, um, very fascinating people. And, um, they are distinct linguistically from everybody else around. So it just adds another layer of complexity uh, to who these people are. And they speak about the giants who were once there, um, and how they, they learned some things and things, bits of knowledge and such were left to them from the giants. That's a whole other, whole other avenue in, unto itself. But more locally, is that, around, a, is that a is that a sorry? But I, I can't let no, that. That's slip right. Off. Go for it. Go for it. That, that's a that's a literal belief in a a race of humanoid giants. Yes. Wow. Can you say anything more about it? It's so fascinating. I mean, that's one of those transcultural things we hear from a lot of different cultures around the world. So it's, it's yeah, fascinating. This is another, it's another avenue of interest for me. And I've been exploring our ancient cultures for a number of, our, you know, remnants of ancient cultures. And really, it's been a fascinating time to get into this study because over the last two years, so much has been emerging. But there's evidence all throughout the Americas um, of these giants and uh, apparently in the 19th century, a great deal of them were dug up, even in North America, a lot in Eastern North America, of course. Um, and then somehow um, those were deposited with the Smithsonian and, and, and supposedly there's, they're nowhere to be found anymore. But these are, <laughs> How tall are yeah. you talking about? How, how, what's the size of these? Uh, Seven to 12 feet is my knowledge. <laughs> yeah. The Seri have not specifically stated, but they just call them Los Gigantes. And the Seri are not yeah. short people. They're, you know, they're well-fed people, and they can be tall and leaf and, and, and very strong. Um, okay. But, yeah, six, six feet is not unusual for, or higher, taller for a Seri male. So tall to them would certainly be seven feet as a giant, you know, seven feet right. and taller. But there are um, uh, stone carvings and, and amulets and things that are found in caves on the island that they do not attribute to their ancestors but to the giants. And right. supposedly there have, there have been, from a helicopter view, I haven't seen the footage, but you can mark out um, uh, stone uh, arrangements. I don't know if they would be called cairns or, or what exactly. And, uh, I've only been told, you know, through Spanish from 
uh, Siri people that received this information from somebody else, but helicopter footage from the island that shows uh, intentional patterns, if not somehow like symbols that they're aware of on these amulets that they find in the caves that they say would have been done by the giants. <laughs> I love that, man. I love just like, I love the mystery, you know, like the universal giggle of like, you can't figure it all out. There's not answers to all of this stuff. It just, no I think way. That's so yeah. yeah. There's always more. There's always more, which, yeah, it's en endlessly fascinating to me. I'm fascinated by Arizona's landscape and partially mm -hmm. because I have a background, um, you know, exploring some things with, with entheogens. Uh, we were sort of mm -hmm. talking about that a moment ago. And Arizona is one of those places in the country where you have sort of an intersection of several um, that are available on the landscape. Like here in Maine, there's not really, uh, I can't forage an entheogen. You know what I mean? It's not that, there's really not a lot here. But I get to the Southwest and, and you know, I've been able to, you know, sit with peyote and sit with, you know, the um, bufo toad. Um, yeah. but also I've had the opportunity now several times, and this is this thing that I've been always very hesitant to bring up because it appears to me, I know it's known, but it, no one I know knows about it. Um, sure. and that's that I've sat with saguaro cactus, um, multiple times. And I, I'm, I struggle to understand how this is unknown to people because the, the entheogenic communities, as you've seen in the last 10 years, has grown tremendously to, to maybe um, maybe to the point that we have to actually, you know, be very conservative about some of these wild species like Manisteriopsis and such um, with so much sort of, you know, American tourism for these things. Um, but here's this plant that grows in our desert southwest that is, you know, however tall they get, 20 feet tall. And the entire plant is this entheogen. Uh, and it seems like nobody really understands or knows about it. And so I'm curious what is known and what cultures were using that plant and, and how they were interacting with it because it's a really powerful medicine. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, I'm excited to welcome a new show sponsor today. Earth Runners is an ancestral inspired sandal company who builds shoes to support a more barefoot experience. They've taken the millennia-old design known as the Hirachi, which is a simple sole with a wrapping lace, one of the oldest designs in history, and upgraded it with Vibram soles and earthing technology to give you the most minimalist, natural, and grounded shoe experience you've ever had. Here's what makes them unique. Earthrunners utilize a copper grommet in the sole and electrically conductive laces to create a connected circuit between you and the ground. It allows a free flow of antioxidant electrons from the ground into your body. I've always believed in taking a minimalist approach to footwear, often going barefoot when I can. My shoe and boot collection are a reflection of a question I always ask myself. What's the minimum amount of shoe I can use for this activity? It allows me to maintain the most critical connection between me and the planet. If you're asking yourself the same question, check out Earthrunners at earthrunners.com and use the coupon code WILDFED for 10% off your order. Hurachi sandals made dynamic, long-range hunting possible for your ancestors. Earthrunners made them electrically grounded so modern humans can stay in touch with the earth. Add a pair of Earthrunners to your minimalist shoe collection. Stay grounded, stay connected. You can find them at earthrunners.com. Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, it is a highly revered plant amongst the, the autumn, Tono autumn, or the Papago, the Spanish name, and locally. Um, to my knowledge, there is no extant. Uh, certainly, you know, extent practices, let alone folklore uh, that I'm aware of about its use as an entheogen. I don't I understand that, because they, they use the fruits pretty extensively, right? Yeah, the fruits, um, the fruits were harvested in mass by the tonnage up until, say, the early 20th century. And that has, I wouldn't say it's died out, but it has dramatically, um, you know, been downgraded as a priority amongst amongst the autumn but i used to visit a camp uh annually run by stella tucker who had taken it over from her aunt who won it uh won the right back from the saguaro national monument to inhabit their ancestral harvesting grounds because they were kicked oh, out oh wow yeah, John, can we can we point. can we explore that a little bit more? Because I want people, I want to give some context for people. So we're talking about the saguaro cactus, which is that classic, iconic desert southwest 
cactus. And maybe you want to say a little bit about it, John, and then and let's talk a little bit too about the National Monument because I want people who haven't spent time there to really understand what we're talking about because um, a lot of you know these these uh, plants are really protected now, as I understand it, and um, I'm curious how that uh, affects the indigenous land use and their ability to continue their practices. Uh, particularly traditional food ways. So maybe you could could uh, imagine somebody who hasn't been there before and kind of uh, lay all that out for us. Sure. It's it, it's an interesting thing. So it's one of those things that it being in Tucson or Phoenix for that matter, it's just like a, you, know, you take it for granted. It's part of the landscape. But uh, when someone comes, for, comes here for the first time, it's one of those things that comes out at them tremendously because when you travel into the hills and they're covered – and these, as you say, very tall cacti, the tallest cacti in, in North America, that this, it leaves a tremendous impression. They have a personality about them. Mm -hmm. um, they are protected, yes, in the sense that there's a state law um, that the entire plants cannot be harvested. And that has to do a lot with um, landscaping practices, you know. People not too long ago would go and dig up a saguaro, a young saguaro, because they are really heavy. A mature saguaro, there's no way you need a, a crane to get that. But and then you could sell it on the market for several hundred dollars because they grow slowly and people will pay a lot for some, you know, semi-mature saguaro. So there's a right there that illustrates that there's a disjunct between, you know, there's a an appreciation that we have for nature where we can drive through and say, oh, isn't that pretty? Isn't that nice? But we don't have a living relationship with it, you know, which you as a hunter and forager, right. you appreciate that you're engaged. It's sustaining you. And there's something else that's happening there too. We could count the calories and count the nutrients and so forth, but there's something else, you know, you now have a stake in this. You have, mm. you have yeah. you've developed a love and affection, not just for the plant, but the soil in which it grows and the rain that sustains it and everything. So you begin to see at least in a broad conceptual sense, an indigenous mindset towards a spirituality, a spiritual connection with the landscape. I feel mm -hmm. that that's the first step in forging is like when you open that door and it's not just, you know, the raspberry, you know, from the plant to your lips. It's like, it's everything that's, that's grown that plant. And as you quietly go through a patch and begin forging, and it's even more intense gathering saguaro fruit because it's at the hottest, driest time of year. So it takes a great deal of spirit <laughs> and, and commitment yeah. to go out and do that. But when you ingest that, I mean, you're tasting something that is, it is beyond, you know, calories or something sweet. It is the sun. It is the harshness of the desert, you know, conspiring in this tremendous way to bring you this most delectable and sweet treat. In them under the most adverse conditions, so I think it's probably one of the best tasting fruits that I've ever ever it's had. I, I um, how many times I've shared that with people all across the globe, and and their their eyes light up when it's like that's the most amazing thing I've ever tasted. <laughs> so, you know, I, I've, <laughs> I, I've never yeah. I've never harvested it, but I, I want to describe it as I understand it just real quickly, and then I'd like for you to flesh it out better because you are obviously experienced with it. But but the the fruits grow from the top of the plant and from the top of the plant's arms, right? Those branches that come off. But as I understand it, they don't even start to branch until they're 75, 100 years old. So these are old plants. The fruits are very high up. And the only thing around you that is long enough for you to reach those fruits on the ground anywhere is going to be the the ribs of uh, deceased uh, saguaro, right? And then yeah. the time of year that they fruit, you're talking about a time of year where you can't really be out on the landscape at noon doing work, right? So describe to people what, you know, the what's and when's and how's that this fruit is gathered um, and stored. And then maybe a little bit about how it was used then and how it's used now. Yeah. And I was introduced in, in really the, the traditional way. So I've always made my kui put, which is the autumn name for it out of saguaro ribs. As you mentioned, yeah, it's the tallest thing on the landscape by and large. So if you're going to use something from the landscape, you really have to use its own ribs and we'll fasten them together, you know, two or three. It can be a little bit rickety to do that. Um, you, you forgo some of the highest fruit. There's just, it's, it's a lot of effort to get up. So something within the 10 or eight to, to 20 foot range is, is optimal. And so this could put you, you, you have a, 
somewhat hor- diagonally placed horizontal uh, cross piece at the top that's maybe 8 to 12 inches long, and that can be used to pull down a fruit or kind of pop it off. So the fruits are actually in a, a thick leathery husk that are, you know, they're, they're closed as, as immature fruits. And then just as they're maturing, they start to turn a bit red on the outside and then they split open at the top. So it almost looks mm-hmm. like a red flower for the you know, uninitiated. And then the, the fruit inside is primarily juice with small bits of fiber and abundant seed. And as it heats up, that sweet juice is, is cooked and dehydrated somewhat in the sun and then forms a, a somewhat solid fruit around the seeds at, per the shape of the outside uh, husk. So it's like an elongated egg. If you could take an egg on each end and stretch it out a bit, it's an elongated elliptical shape. And so those, uh, I de- my personal preference is to get them when they're already dry. It's a little bit cleaner that way. And you can sometimes just pick them off right off the ground. I've been able at, at times to walk up to one cactus and pull uh, two gallons off the ground right at my feet. Oh, okay. Most, which is, you know, or you could spend, <laughs> uh, conversely, you could spend two or three hours, you know, with a lot of exertion to find that much. It, it just depends. Um, I'm not sure if I if I remembered all of your questions, so I don't want to oh, um, yeah, disregard Yeah, them. well, describe the, the time of year and the conditions because yeah. – you know, I think a lot of people picture foraging like, um, you know, like the fool card in the tarot, you know, like you just got a basket and you're just kind of drifting through fields and everything, you know, but that that's like a fairly, I, one of the things people have said about the show Wild Fed that we make is they said, hey, I never realized that foraging was like, had an adventure component to it, <laughs> you know, oh, yeah. they th- they picture it more like just, you know, pulling lettuce leaves out of the garden, but it, it, it can be, sometimes you've got a lot of components, whether they're travel over landscape or whether they're, you know, difficult conditions or whatever it might be. But it's, it's always seemed to me that the saguaro fruit harvest was kind of one of the more extreme forages as far as conditions go. It certainly can be. And so, um, as you painted the picture, it's extremely hot. It's the hottest. It's not the, the necessarily the most intense heat, depending on how you look at it, because it's not humid. It's completely dry. And so the mornings are still cool, fortunately, around this time. And around this time, uh, I mean, basically through June, and now it's shifted a little bit into the beginning of July. And so it's the hot and dry season as we're building up towards the summer rains. And this year was exceptionally hot, and it was hot for an extended period of time. Probably the 100-degree day started in early May and are are persisting until now. But throughout June, we had really high temperatures, um, often, you know, 105 to 110. And so... um, we don't observe daylight savings time here. So in June, you know, the first rays of light visible uh, could be around 4.30. So you might want to be up and ready to go by 4 to get out to where you're going and then show up, you know, a good 45 minutes before sunrise. And then so you have several hours uh, to put in, you know, where it's not oppressively hot. But I also found that if I start early enough, the gradual onset of the heat, meaning like from starting at 75 and then getting to 90 by 9 a.m., is not as intense as like wandering out at 7.30 or 8, you know, into a wall of heat if I'm in an air-conditioned right. home. So that gradualness really um, helps helps me acclimate much better to the point where I can, um, I can go until about 11 a.m., you know, so I can put in a solid – five or six hours if I'm if I'm focused on the day before I'm like, okay, that's enough. But most people um, don't even venture out at that time, let alone try to put in several hours. So it's it's the smart <laughs> approach in the desert to get out really early, you know, and you put in a hot, half a day to two thirds of a day before like super oppressive heat sets in. But that's when the fruit are really cooking. And so we want the heat if it's not hot enough the fruit don't really mature as well. In fact, the, the tastiest saguaro fruits that I've had are wherever the, the heat has been greatest, most concentrated for the, you know, the greatest length of time. Um, I love it. What, really, do you, what do you, go ahead. I was just going to mention that in, um, in the, the literature of the 18th, yeah, early 18th century by the Spanish uh, uh, Jesuits and, and friars and such that were here in their observation of the indigenous people, they noted that um, most commonly when the winters were dry, 
that the columnar cacti fruit were, were in greatest abundance. By columnar cacti, I mean the saguaro, the organ pipe. Um, there's other types of organ pipe further south in Sonora and Echo and, um, and uh, Sahueso is another one that looks a lot like saguaro and it has not just red, but also white, orange, and pink flesh fruits. <laughs> pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty wild when you get into Sonora. But um, so another thing to mention too, it, um, uh, anthropologically, you might say, in regards to the people's relationship with the cactus, these were all leaf um, uh, hunter-gatherer slash agriculturalists, and uh, this was the time of year when they would when they would uh, binge eat. And so the, the 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 people who are recording this history of, of Spanish descent observing at the missions, they say you know, people would just disappear all of a sudden off the mission and not return for several weeks completely unrecognizable, having put on like 20, 30, 40 pounds or more. <laughs> just abundant, abundant cactus fruit, you know? So like, uh, wow. obviously like inducing some insulin resistance uh, by consuming all these sugars and like, you know, putting on all of this, this weight to store them through into the winter. Like a bear almost. And then I also have read a lot about a sort of wine and a, and a, you know, a mm. ceremony of, of, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and one of the things that I've read about, it's really interesting to me is in a culture, you know, when I, when I think about hunter gatherers, uh, versus agriculturalists, one of the things that really stands out to me is that agriculturalists tend to have a very ready, uh, supply of alcohol 365 days a year. So that, you know, it's, you could almost say civilization's an alcoholic in that sense, uh, versus hunter gatherers who tend to have alcohol in very limited amounts during times of abundance of certain sugars that can be fermented. So if I've read it right, I got the impression that like once a year, there's like quite a party but that, you know, it's almost used and was used in a visionary sense. Again, I'm saying this from reading anthropology, not from, from personal experience, but do you know anything about uh, sort of the, the wine that would be made or the, the beverage that would be made from it? Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I certainly haven't experienced it. And to my knowledge, that doesn't really happen anymore uh, or hasn't happened in quite some time. But yes, uh, I believe it was very concisely held within that time frame of the Saguaro harvest and it was very intentional. In fact, there was a separate structure built just for the, the fermentation process and there would be what's called the medicine people, Makai would be the, the name in the, um, in the local dialect that would be singing over this, uh, over this brew for an extended for four days. And so that was the that was the fermentation time into this hot weather, and the vessel that was used for it was used year to year and was held just for that purpose. And oh, there was cool. a particular inoculate that was used, um, quite possibly stored on some animal tissue from year to year. You know, it's desiccated, oh. but held yeah held uh, in, wow. in yeah in in that state for for the year, and then reintroduced to the sugars, and it would activate again. <laughs> and uh, that, that, I guess, kind of disappeared over 100 years ago from what I've read. I haven't spoken to anyone who could, you know, further enlighten me on that. But that was – there was so there was a consistent inoculate – well, consistent in the sense that it was derived from the same piece. But, of course, it would be presumably adapting uh, to new conditions over time. But that was, it, that was all part of the, the process. And then, yes, it was a free-for-all from what I've been told. And that was, you know, communal drunkenness and any children that were born roughly eight to 10 months after that, nobody said, nobody said, asked a word about, you know, like just wipe the slate clean type yeah. of festivities, but you wow. know, not just debauchery. There was, a, there was a spiritual, so it's the new year. It's the new year celebration for the autumn and for the Seri who I mentioned, um, at, uh, in, in their calendar, it, it's the new year because that's when the rains arrive. And so mm-hmm. a lot of the ceremony around the harvesting of the saguaro, the consumption of it, making the, the wine and drinking the wine was to initiate this, um, this fertility of, uh, of the land once again, to reinvigorate the land with the fertile rains. Mm-hmm. Um, because that warm, moist air comes up from the south and uh, and brings brings the rain and can nourish the crops or revitalize the landscape to feed the the game that would be hunted or the 
the the wild plants that would be gathered from. So that's that's really I believe the central focus of the whole endeavor is to celebrate the re the reinvigoration of life. In some ways that maybe some European cultures might have focused on around a winter solstice time. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense because the, there's the geographic component there. Um, I want to come up to the present here and uh, because we've been talking this whole time and I haven't really given you the space to say kind of what you do today. And <laughs> I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Like I said, I'm a big fan of your books and... Um, I'm very excited for the next trip that I take there um, because yeah. now I have, you know, uh, before what would happen is I, I go to Arizona a lot, um, not so much in the last couple of years as I did in the past, but in the past I'd go multiple times a year. Now, now I try to get out there at least once a year. Um, and I would pick up, you know, books here in gift shops and things like that, that might be plant guides, but I didn't have something that really spoke, you know, specifically to, you know, at foraging for food or for medicine. And so I'm really pumped about these books. Um, but anyway, bring us up to the present. Tell us a bit about what you do and uh, sort of, you know, what your personal practices are like and then your professional life too. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I uh, appreciate that question. Yeah. In, in large part, this is what I do. I talk about these things, but it's, it's varied. And I've, I've been one, I guess, uh, to a fault at times uh, to diversify my activities, but it's really been centered around plants. So um, as an outpouring of my relationship with the local landscape, one of the first things in terms of like coming to terms with creating a livelihood out of this and not just having it be a spiritual practice, which is um, what I was getting around to saying in some of those uh, stories that I related from the past, it really became a spiritual practice for me. But I had to come to terms with the reality of I can't just live out of my van and 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 be camping most of the year and spending time with plants entirely. I need to actually make some money to, to buy some substantial food every now and then. So um, I started Desert Tortoise Botanicals in 2005 as an outpouring of this relationship with the wild plants and started making tinctures and things and selling them at the local farmer's market. And now that's grown into pretty sizable business, I suppose, um, where we do most of our, our work online and just uh, opened a new production facility in the past year. So I've been spending a lot of time on that um, and trying to cultivate a sustainable business model with sound values that can, um, you know, as, as I expand the team, continue to perpetuate this, this quality of relationship with plants and what we, what we, you know, put into the medicine. So not something that's really geared towards the, the, you know, the modern conventional concept of scaling up substantially. It's much more about building a strong foundation of uh, uh, values in relationship with the plants, in relationship with each other as, as co-workers, and um, prioritizing authenticity at all levels. And so that's been a big, big part of my, my time commitment of late, but um, I've shifted some energy most recently because of you know, this, this thing that's been happening to us over the past several months and, and keeping us separate from each other, I've been unable to do a lot of what I would have otherwise been doing this year and um, traveling to different places. I canceled trips to Texas, to Las Vegas, to, um, to France, and, and elsewhere where I was going to be teaching. And so I decided to start making some uh, recordings and doing some live virtual plant walks and then some recorded ones so I could get out of cell phone range and go to some more distant places. And so I've been sharing those with my email subscribers um, and you can uh, register for those on my website or now I have some of the recordings for sale in there. So it's my, my, my objective in that is not just to be informative about the plants, but try to sustain my, my original intentions in being a bridge between the plants and people. That, that in large part has been my mission that I recognize has been given to me that I can somehow convey authentically what plants want to say, not which is in part what they can be useful for, but there's other messages that come through at times yeah. that I yeah. feel it can be really valuable to people and in, in what they're seeking or what they're needing. Could you give us an example of, I, I'm, I'm like really feeling what you're saying, but I just want for people who are going kind of like, what does he mean sure. by that? Well, give us an example of a way a plant might give you a, a message beyond 
just what its its medicinal compounds are, just what its antioxidants are, just what calories it contains. Because obviously, yeah. you know, it's easy for us to forget that these not you know not maybe you and I, but I think for the average person that these plants you know pre exist human beings and our entire lineage of apes, um, that they are here doing their own thing outside of what benefits we might get from consuming them. Uh, they're their own entities with their own agendas and their own natural histories and life histories and all of that. Uh, but kind of give us an example of what you mean about how a plant might have something to communicate. These messages can come through to each individually distinctly for where they're at. And um, so for one example is... On this first virtual plant walk, I was compelled to start speaking about the relationship with the landscape and how that informs my understanding of each medicine. So there's a, there's a contextual awareness about each plant that when you come into its presence and you allow yourself to be receptive to what you're actually feeling and not committed to negating what you feel – at the expense of your reductive intellectual capacities, but actually receive that and allow yourself to process that and trust in it without doubting it, then you can, you can become exceptionally wise about applications of, of plants. With, whether those applications are known and now you're applying them to yourself effectively, or they are entirely unknown in the, in the world of literature, applications of these plants, but because of what you receive and you listen, you can apply them effectively. I realize that's a bit more general example, but um, right now I'm not I'm not connecting with a very specific example. But the, it's the voice of the plants coming through what I feel and helping people to open their minds to possibilities. What do you think about the the present state and I guess maybe short term future? for people. We're talking about a few things that have come up here. It's like, we've been talking about the indigenous, their sort of displacement, not just from the land, but from their life way. I guess those two things are really inextricable, like you were saying. Um, there's the current situation of human beings, which is they are, are massively divorced from the natural landscape, um, uh -huh. but then consuming tremendous amounts of resources that originate from the landscape without really understanding or knowing that they're doing that. I don't think people, I'm not faulting people. We don't, we don't, they don't know and we don't know. Um, right. But, you know, here we are on the landscape and we're getting, you could say that we, and when I, I'm going to say the word medicine, but I mean it um, at many levels. I mean the actual compounds in plants, but I also mean um, the kind of thing you were just alluding to a moment ago. Um, we are, we, you could say that we have like a tremendous deficiency or almost like starving to death from a lack of our, of plant relationships and relationships to plant communities. Um, yeah. now we have the situation that you brought up earlier, which has led to this distancing between people. Um, and there's this sense of just this accelerated kind of crazy that's taking place. So I'm just curious from the where you're sitting, and of course, I don't expect you to prognosticate or anything, but just where do you see all this kind of, where do you see that we're at and where do you see all this going? Um, how does how does this work that you do relate? Because I know it does, right? It all It's all woven together. So where, where do you see this thing headed? I appreciate you asking that question. So I'm going to take it back a few months and late March... Uh, you know, where we're at in late March, things were very, very new in this phase of being. And so a lot of questions, a lot of concerns and, and fears were certainly beginning to, to ramp up. And I had a, a field study scheduled for the first weekend of, of April. And I still felt convicted about um, going ahead with this and ended up doing it. And I had about half the class decided to cancel and I was okay with that. And the other half decided to come. So it's okay, we're going to do this. This is going to be an exploration. And so in, and this came from my, my relationship with the landscape, arriving there, asking the questions, asking to be led in what was the, 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 the most suitable path, the most suitable approach for us to really embrace where we're at right now in conjunction with this landscape and its wisdom and what it has to share with us. And so if there is something that really threatens us, is there something that threatens us in the world that we need to be, you know, that we need to be concerned with and, and develop defenses for and take, and take measures towards, 
And if so, what might that be? And so it was a somewhat open-ended question, but, you know, taking into account where people's minds and hearts may be. Instead of, I could take uh, an alternate approach where I'm going to research all the plants in this landscape, identify the ones that have constituents that have been known to be effective against the virus, you know, and give someone a treatise on, you know, these constituents and what we know they can do in vitro and, and yada, yada, which I understand has its value. And I certainly do endeavor in, in that type of research, but I really wanted to embrace the whole as much as possible and, mm-hmm. and allow for an unlimited potential for what we could experience in this endeavor. And so that's how we approached it. And we, sp- we sat with a lot of plants and we felt into the experience and I'll, I'll say for myself, largely what I took away from it, uh, and there was a quintessential moment when o- with Ocotillo, the plant Ocotillo, when this came through, is that really what we have to fear the most is fear itself. And I see that now um, exponentially so uh, from this vantage point, three and a half months later since early April, how that has grown within our culture and how much havoc that is wreaked. In, in, in the public, in individuals' lives. And I don't see that leading in, in, a, in a positive direction, you know, until it really bottoms out. So that is my biggest concern right now is, is to what extent people are willing to embrace fear and act from a place of fear. And so I found that it's, it's, my, it's my role each day to find a place of positive engagement with the natural world that allows me to disengage from what's happening within culture, not as a means of ignoring it, but as a means of choosing something that has a a potential positive outcome, not choosing something where I'm limited by the scope of my fear and my ignorance. And so how I see that playing out for everyone, for all of us, I think is to the extent that we can find a minimal critical mass that choose each day to engage with the natural world, which includes each of us and all, all of our selves um, in a way that is, is positive and creative, whether that means going out and foraging, whether that means, you know, reconnecting with nature in some small practice um, so that you can find a clear head when you go out, you know, to, to work in the medical establishment for that matter, you know, and bring this sense of awareness to people so that there's a, at some point, in, there's a way station where you run into an individual that's grounded, that is not, you know, reacting to this world out of fear. Because that's, I think, that, that just fear feeds upon fear. And so where each one of us decide to go that direction, we inevitably pull several with us. You're saying that, like, uh, by being that person, you can become like an anchor point for calm and sanity and, and love and all those things when you're out in a world full of people who are maybe getting a little frantic and scared? I do believe so. And, and yeah. that way we, every person has that capacity as well. And they really need to see it from somebody else at, mm-hmm. at times, you know, to be encouraged to go in that direction. And I've, I've heard many stories uh, already over the past several months, <clears throat> excuse me, to that effect where somebody came forth with a sense of fear about them, but the other person didn't capitulate in that. And the, the, the initial person actually came around to say, wow, you know, I'm really thankful that you, you know, behave this way with me because I I realized that, you know, I'm just, I'm just giving into fear and I I don't want to do that. So I see how it can work, you know, immediately uh, as, as we, as we, you know, courageously, engage with, with with each other this way. I don't think it takes a heroic attempt, but a heroic attempt in the near future might simply be walking out into the world, you know, uh, without embracing the collective fear. <laughs> it's amazing that's becoming a revolutionary act, but as you know, it, it, it really is. is. I, I hadn't left town uh, really for a little while, and I, I you know, I... I took a drive recently. There's a, a guy in, um, on the Delaware river who maintains a very large stone eel weir. And, uh, it's one of the last mm. people doing it. And I went to visit him and I hadn't really been South for a while. So it was like, I had to drive to New York and 
I guess I had thought that more people were in the place that I was around all of this. And I realized, oh, they're not. <laughs> they're not at all. And I mean, I I guess I just didn't realize. I thought, I guess, you know, it's that thing of the echo chamber where the people around me tend to be people who are feeling very calm and very healthy and very strong and have a very level head about it. But I, I recognize now that um, culturally I was missing a little bit about, you know, how seriously people were. Um, not just taking it, but how afraid they actually were of one another. That's the thing that, uh, that's the hardest to see. Yes. And to, to maybe answer your question a bit more fully, I do feel that, um, my personal opinion is that it will continue to get worse before it gets better, which is only going to challenge each of us all the more to not go there to really, Mm -hmm. you know, connect, reconnect with our hearts on a, on a daily basis Whatever that means, you know, with your own individual sense of awareness of yourself and your passion, your connection to life, how do you embrace that? How do you cultivate that? As opposed to choosing judgment or, you know, anger or resentment or whatever uh, form of aggression that you might be, you know, encouraged or uh, inspired to enact in with, you know, the people around you, let that go find a positive outlet, out, outlet, which may be simply re-engaging with nature, going for a walk, investigating the plants that are popping up in the summer, you know, go back to your favorite stand of oak trees and see how the acorns are developing. I feel there's so many innocuous and benign yet potentially powerful ways that we can engage with nature that would, um, I think it's when, when we're not looking for the answers is when they can come most strikingly. Mm. how to pray and so that that form of like just letting go i'm just going to go for a walk in the forest and i don't i'm not really pondering necessarily like intensely these questions of what's going to happen to us or where we're going to go should, what should i do with my money and how am i going to get my food and that can create an intense anxiety which it just wraps itself up so i feel it's a really powerful practice to just let all that go and then move into nature in the most fluid way that you can and allow for things to come out of that experience as, as you're ready to receive them. You know, there's something really interesting here in what we're talking about in that the practices of, um, I'll speak just specifically hunting, fishing, foraging, making medicine from the landscape, or even things like, you know, making cordage or something like that, some of the more primitive skills, that from yeah. the outside, to an outsider, it sounds like, well, why would you do that when there's so much work that it takes? You know, acorns are a great example. Why would you do that when I can just go buy a bag of corn flour for a dollar? Like, it makes no sense to them at first. But then when you do some of these practices, you realize it's about a lot more than those immediate returns because it's like the chop wood carry water thing. It's that these practices, it's not about how many calories or how, you know, you get great food, you get great medicine, you get all those, but these practices connect you into the community of life in a way. I guess what I feel for a lot of people is that by being disconnected from so many species, like if you really only know humans, cats, and dogs, and maybe a couple of houseplants, it's a very lonely place in the world. But when you have a relationship with 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 species, you you are one one more individual enmeshed in this community of different organisms and all mutually supporting one another. And so you don't have that sense of aloneness. And right now I'm seeing that there's this just tremendous aloneness, you know, beneath all this anger and aggression we see from people out there right now is like all the sadness and they feel like they are alone and and it's not hard to see why. And even if you don't have relationships with lots of people, just going out and spending time with the the oaks or the nettles or the saguaros or whatever it is, you realize like, oh, I'm part of something bigger. I'm not, I'm not alone here. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of what I see. Uh, I I think you're right on. I I completely relate. I just came back from a few days up in the white mountains in, in Arizona, very sparsely populated area and it's it's the the place that actually birthed me as a bioregional herbalist where i how i went in depth in this place um mostly alone in the wilderness um but i have some friends there and uh but anyway when i went to go see some of these plants it was like i was visiting old friends i recognized them and i felt that they recognized me it was 
quite an emotional experience. To, I was sharing with the, a, a, a human friend of mine there who's in um, who's in the program AA, and uh, I said it was like I was going to visit my sponsor <laughs> for people <laughs> to, uh, with that you know with that terminology because you know they they really they watch out for me you know and they they remind me of of my shortcomings not in a aggressive way but in you know in a supportive way so i can keep tabs on myself and um and, and make the, the the best well-rounded version of myself that's really where i feel the plants are supportive but they also lift me up at the same time and uh that's you know that, that isn't something that just happened overnight it has been cultivated through a lot of experience um yet at the same time there were profound initial experiences for me that kind of opened the way so I, I really encourage people to, to just get out there and open their minds. Um, I've had the experience of opening my mind. And then, you know, I speak a lot about, you know, this kind of abstract approach. And I really do that, I feel, because it's my, my calling and because the, it, there's so few voices in this area. I can certainly go to the intellectual productive uh, approach as well. I learned... I mastered the scientific names for the plants in my area. And once I, once I succumbed to doing that, it became all encompassing to where I would go out there and I just see Encelia, Carnegie, Opuntia, Sonjapuntia, uh, Cremaria. And it was almost like a rock, uh, a raucous noise within my head that I couldn't quiet. So I really had to, had to um, meet that obstacle, quiet that noise and, Bring myself back into the heart, essentially, to begin to perceive the environment as a living, fluid entity, not just a static, compartmentalized, you know, uh, data point in the landscape. Which is certainly what, whether you have an academic background or not, you know, if you're involved with this society through social media or whatever it may be, you're going to be encouraged in that direction, and. Um, you know, the reality is if anyone's really, really, you know, approached the natural world in this way is that it, it's a much bigger world than that. And each moment which we really bring our attention and our awareness and our heart center to is a threshold into a vastly greater space of expansion. Man, I'm really glad to hear you say that because this, a lot of what you're describing has happened to me and it happened to me slowly and subtly and it came about because the, the approach that I had taken, a more heart-centered approach to connecting with nature, was sometimes a hindrance to connect with some of the people that I wanted to. They didn't speak that language, and they saw it as flaky or new agey or something like that. And so I learned yeah. the language of science to describe these things. And in the process, you know, slowly, slowly start to, like you said, it starts to contract part of your ability to receive a little bit and, uh, and balancing those things. You know, I think there's so much benefit. Scientific method is brings many benefits too. And, you know, I know it's a balance of these things, but, um, but we're a little skewed in one direction. I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. I have a great story to share in that regard where it kind of brought things all together for me. If, if I may. Please, please. Uh, yeah. So I have a, just real quick, I have a, a four directional model of, knowledge gathering that I go by. Um, in the East is the scientific reductive method. And so in the South, you have your personal experience. In the West, you have intuitive insight. In the North, you have our ancestors, that which came before. Mm -hmm. Not one of them is prioritized over the other, but it's how you bring all of them together, in a sense, amalgamated in the center at the heart. So, um, I was in Breckenridge several years ago for an herbal conference, and um, one of the days I led a plant walk, and at the end of that plant walk, I decided to have everyone in the group, about a dozen people or so, 15 maybe, sit around this plant, and whether they knew anything about it, the better that they don't, um, we're going to just, I'm not going to say anything about this plant whatsoever, we're just going to sit with it. I guided them through a, a simple meditation, and where we're bringing our minds down into our hearts, becoming receptive and just observe what happens, you know, without judgment or, or anything, don't embellish on it, just let it flow. So it's an exercise. And within that, 
um, I received some messages from this plant that were really unique, kind of struck me. Um, the plant, I'll say, was a plant called fireweed or willow herb. You might have it in the in the northeast. Is that right? We do. Yes, it's, it's flowering right now. Yeah, a cone okay. of purple, yeah. a, a kind of a cone of purple flowers at the top. Yeah, purple it's flower. in the evening yeah. primrose family, so it's got four yep. petals, and it's yep. native to Europe. And um, yeah, medicinal herb, edible when it's young. And so I, I had a you know working knowledge of this plant, but see if I can remember something like courage, um, adeptness, erection, male reproductive system. So I was kind of like shaking my head, huh, I don't really understand this plant in this way. But so I, admittedly, I started to like doubt, like, well, where am I getting this from? You know, like, am I making this up? Even I've done this countless times, hundreds of times with myself and with other people, I still, you know, had doubts. All right, I let that go, kind of file it in the background. And the next morning, I'm going for a walk again on the, the ski slopes. This was at a, at a resort in the ski, uh, about 10,500 feet in Colorado in the Rockies. And um, there was a patch of it. And so I walked up to the patch, and I knelt down, grabbed a leaf, um, crushed it up, tasted it. And I was just sitting there with as calm a mind as possible, still early morning, and um, just spent a couple of minutes just in quiet contemplation. I stood up, started to walk through the patch, and I hear aromatase, just the word aromatase. And I was like, startled, like, what? Did I just, huh? I didn't even, I didn't even have a concept of that. And it just came into my head. And then immediately I got excited. I remember what I what had come to me the day before in regards to the male reproductive system. So, okay, I got to check this out. So I get on the search engine, type in epilobium, which is the genus of the plant at the time, uh, and aromatase. Sure enough, late 1990s, there was a study found that willow herb, by, uh, aka ep, um, epilobium, forget the species name right now, uh, inhibited aromatase and found to be protective against benign hyperplasia, prostate inflammation, and sure enough, there's already some products that were in circulation that were wow. directed at this specific thing. So this to me was like, an aha moment. Wow. I actually have been on the right track, you know, and, uh, and now I'm practicing what I'm preaching, uh, without thinking about it. You know, it wasn't a really, um, it wasn't a systematic approach in that, okay, I'm going to look at it this way, then that way, and that way, and then have all bases covered. I was really just flowing through it quite naturally. And, and this unfolded for me. And that was all built on, you know, experience of studying pathophysiology, ethnobotany, botany and then having my own personal experience like really engaging with the plants not just pointing oh there's epilobium you know i sat down with it i tasted it i felt it and then something happened you know so all four of those directions came together in this one experience where like i know in my heart that there's there's knowledge there i've been conspired with with nature with the plant with previous humans and what they've been inspired to to research so that to me is the beauty of what I call bioregional herbalism because it, it transcends all of these areas of, of knowledge gathering and really uh, becomes accentuated in the individual where the individual is at in their own experience and can therefore convey very powerfully to whomever they may engage with. Wow, I, re I needed that story, man. I, I got to say I'm really excited for the audience to hear this uh, conversation, but, uh, I think some of the things you're saying are like a personal invitation to me that I, I really needed. So thank you for, uh, speaking from the heart, man. And, um, also just, sorry, nerd alert here, but quick question, aerial parts of that plant that, you, that, uh, yeah, that the, the message wasn't specific to a part, but my assumption is that yes, I don't think it, it a, a root is required. Got it. Uh, it's already getting to the nitty gritty there, but yeah, oh, back cool. to, back to what you were just saying. I'm, um, wh what I like, uh, I like that approach because people have a tendency, you, this four directional approach, because there's such a tendency to be like this or this when it's like often yeah. it's both or more than both. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's not always easy for our, our minds today, the way we've, you know, our minds have gotten structured on this binary way of thinking. So, 
Uh, man, I really appreciate it. Hey, can people work with you in person uh, still? And if so, how do they connect with you there? And and also, I want to know for folks who are going to either visit the desert or um, or live in the desert southwest, um, how do they get involved, get started, or or connect in with you and your community there? Yeah, I appreciate you asking. So my website, johnjslattery.com, I upload events, upcoming events. Um, so that's that's the easiest way to see like where I may be teaching. That is highly limited right now. But in fact, next week, I'm going to be traveling to northern Utah for the Fire to Fire gathering. And so I'll be teaching there as a three-day gathering um, the, the two this year. It's a skills gathering, so you have all varieties of skills like you were mentioning earlier between cordage and pottery making and bow making and silversmithing and, and you name it. So I'll be teaching about plants and relationship to the landscape through plants. Um, I've been working on reinstating my apprenticeship that I did uh, from 2010 to 2016, uh, looking at a new iteration of that. And so that's still rumbling beneath the surface as I wait to see how things unfold. It, it, it definitely feels like the, you know, the world is kind of on pause for the next several months as, yeah. as many major transformations take place you know, and, and people are being, being cautious, which I completely appreciate. But I will be continuing to, you know, do my thing and, and stay engaged with the natural landscape. And in part, I will be um, taking that information that I, I received to really find the best way to, to connect with people. Because that's, that's, my, that's my mission is to help people develop meaningful relationship with plants. And whether I have to do that virtually for a time being, um, I'm, I'm willing to do that. But ultimately, I do have my sights on reinstating uh, an apprenticeship program of sorts where people could be involved with desert tortoise botanicals and helping there and then also going out into the landscape with me uh, around Tucson uh, throughout the year. So if you're interested in something like that, I would highly suggest getting on my email um, subscriber list, which you can do at johnjslattery.com. It's a little bit clandestine, but once you get on the page, there's a red uh, bell that pops up and you click on that and then you can put your, your, um, your info in there. Oh well, man, um, I really suggest people do it. It's like you got some really beautiful things going there. Um, I'll be getting on your list and uh, just hoping we can connect down there sometime. Um, I like I said, I, I love it out there so much, and I, I'm looking forward to my next visit. Actually, Arizona was the last place I went before all of this began, and I remember walking walk the rim of the Grand Canyon with my wife. She had um, paddled the Grand Canyon twice in a kayak, so she's been, done two um, 17 day expeditions through the Grand Canyon but had never seen it from the top. <laughs> and so I brought her to the rim and, and everybody, you know, it was when it was first starting, we first starting seeing mass and all of that. And so that's kind of the last place I was spent some time in Sedona. And anyway, I just looking forward to getting back out there. Um, man, thank you so much for what you've shared with the audience here. And thank you for those messages that have come directly to me to uh, really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, needed to hear some of that. And Really, really appreciate the work you're doing. Also, I just want to say, um, I don't know if you want to say anything about your books because they're beautiful, um, very yeah. instructive, um, and uh, really useful for anybody who's got a, a library of uh, you know books about foraging or making medicine. These are pretty crucial to your library, particularly if you spend any time in the desert. So, John, maybe you want to just um, tell people what these two books are about and uh, kind of what they contain. Sure. So the, the first book that I was asked to write was Southwest Foraging. So that's focused on edible plants within the greater Southwest region. Um, the, the Southwest was defined in that book by the publisher to include all of Texas, all the way uh, to edge of Arizona, Southern Utah, Nevada, and Oklahoma. I refined the second book, Region Bioregion, to be more distinctly our own and Southwest Medicinal Plants. It runs up to Central Texas or the Balcones Escarpment, so it includes Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, um, a great deal of Oklahoma, Western Oklahoma, uh, Southern Colorado, Southern Utah, Southern Nevada, down into Southern California. Believe it or not, all of that whole area, including Arizona and Mexico, there's a lot of overlap. With, with plants. So um, you won't find every single plant in all those places, but a great deal of them are, are well represented. So it's, it's written with an idea to introduce people to their local landscape with ideas and exercises, even on how to go out into the landscape and gather information, like I was just referring to, uh, some information about how to make medicine with these plants, 
um, looking at future harvests. So how to how to gather in a way or maybe even bring the plant into your home landscape. I have suggestions for that. Numerous uh, traditional and even clinical applications, uh, for, uh, uh, topical and internal. So it's, it's really about cultivating a foundation for becoming bioregional in your approach to making medicine, maybe first with what's in your yard or going out into the broader landscape and, and exploring even more deeply. And those both are available, of course, on Amazon, but I have them for sale on my website, too, if you'd like to support the author. And uh, yeah, I'll just say, too, the, the Southwest Foraging book is 117 plants, and the uh, medicinal book is 112 plants, so pretty rich with content. Anyway, yeah, really beautiful offerings to the world, man, and um, just thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for taking the time and coming on the show today. No, thank you, Daniel. It's been great. I feel like I could talk to you for a long time, and if... Um, if you do make it out here again before too long, please reach out. I think we have a fun time uh, going on a hike and checking out plants together. Yeah, I definitely will, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.